Hello there, I'm Black Bright and I broadcast out of the UK into your homes, onto your phones and into your space and today I'm going to do a roundup of all the, what I deem interesting things going on around the world and even in our own communities and um, if you like what I talk about please hit the thumbs up, a thumbs down, if you think somebody else might be interested you can share or you can subscribe. And uh, returning subscribers and new subscribers, I just want to show my appreciation and say thank you. Um, today I wanted to talk about Donald Trump. He's refusing, like a little spoilt boy, not to wear a mask. Apparently it's voluntary, he says. He doesn't have to follow medical guidance. It's not mandatory. And he will not, he doesn't think, be wearing a mask. And I couldn't help wondering if what kind of mask would he wear? And I don't think, I mean, I was thinking, could he wear a red mask, a red mask to match his tie or a light blue one to match his blue tie? What about a patriotic one that has the American flag on it? But Trump being the way he is, so preoccupied with his appearance, he is quite vain. So, pre so preoccupied with his appearance, would he really be caught wearing a mask, especially when it's quite similar to certain cultures? I don't think he would. I think he is much too... I mean, he said he wouldn't wear one of those things in public and he couldn't be seen greeting people with a mask on his face. But there again, he's not supposed to be really in close proximity to anyone anyway. And I'm sure that he would, um, and I'm sure that he makes it difficult for people that he meets who might want to wear a mask, and because he's not wearing one and he's the president, they feel as though they can't wear a mask either. Because can you imagine if his principle is, look, I am not going to greet heads of state and, um, you know, whether it's kings or prime ministers or whoever with a mask on my face. Can you imagine how they would feel? they would feel compelled not to wear one either, even though inside they would prefer to, do, prefer to do so because they are more likely to be in close proximity with a lot of people. So, but he chooses not to, that's his choice. But he's not send, sending a very good message. It's not a good example to the Americans who have been told that by medical advice to wear masks. I mean, how much is the, um, is 278,458 cases now in America and 7,000 deaths, three of those deaths, 3,000 of those deaths are in New York. So it's not like it's any dibby dibby numbers. So if you choose to, um, in this time, not to wear a mask, because you, you're so preoccupied with how you're going to look, you're so vain, and you, you, you just don't feel as though you could wear one. Well, what can we say about that? He's been tested, he feels confident enough. So, so be it. There's nothing more I can really say about that, but I did want to mention it. So we also have fraudsters exploiting COVID-19, and this is the time when scams are rampant. And it's such a shame because... There's been 509 scams so far received by Action Fraud. And forces have scammed 1.6 million over COVID-19 hyped fears. From asking for payments for victims to telling people they have been spotted outside their homes more than once and they have to pay £250. Can you imagine? Donations, they've been, these scammers have been asking for donations to the NHS to help fight COVID-19. And people have been paying because they seem plausible. Um, they've been offering jobs, you know, people are vulnerable, they don't have any work. So these scammers have been offering jobs and charging a betting fee. And people have also been ordering protective masks and hand sanitizer and hand sanitizers that never arrive. So they've been paying out all this extra money to get them and they just don't arrive. And then 
there's also a warning. Don't make any rash decisions with any of your savings or your pension money. Okay, because, you know, this is the time when people have plenty of time to think of ways to exploit the vulnerable and the weak and especially those people who feel sorry for other people. It's always like the little good guys that get done because they feel compassionate and they think, well, I don't really have it, but that person really needs it, so therefore I'm going to give it only to find that they've been scammed. It's always the nice little old ladies or the nice little old gentlemen or the kind people. They tend to get scammed because the regular person is like, look, I, I can't even manage myself when they're putting up all these adverts asking you to donate £10 or whatever it is, people are, the, the majority of people would be thinking, you know, I can't even help myself. I'm not going to be giving out £10. I need that to do A, B, C, D and E. They'd be looking to look after themselves. But those people who think about other people, they all seem to be the ones that get pulled in. And it's such a shame because it breaks their trust and makes them become bitter and resentful just because they trusted somebody. But you have to remember there's people out there, they don't give a toss. They don't care how. They're really, really convincing. So you just have to be on the alert. Um, there have been 18 countries that have no coronavirus outbreaks at all, according to John Hopkins um, University. And they are um, Comoros, Kiribati, never heard of that one, Lesotho, Marshall Islands, Micro, Micro, Micronesia, never even heard of that one, Nauru, N-A-U-R-U, 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 um, never heard of that one, North Korea, Palau, P-A-L-A-U, Samoa, Seatomi and Principe, Solomon Islands, South Sudan, Tajikistan, Tongo, Turkmenistan, Tuvalu, Vanuatu and Yemen. No cases at all in those areas. I mean, I know they're quite remote, but I'd be very interested. Um, is it because the people haven't travelled out of the country and they've had no people coming in? They should do a research um, of people, of countries that don't have the coronavirus because um, but then by going in there they might create it might know they might infect it so probably maybe not Sweden there's no lockdown in Sweden and no quarantine restaurants are doing business as usual the malls have people up and down shopping even though they have a thousand four thousand people who have now hold on a minute yeah yeah, they've got all the restaurants. They're going, they're going, doing business, and the malls and the shopping, they're doing good business. But then I would, I put here, is it because the job has been done? Four thousand people in Sweden have had the microchips inserted into their hands, which are designed to speed up daily routines and make their lives more convenient. Swiping their hands against digital readers. The Swedes are more compliant, but with with a defiant population, it could be drastic measures which need to be enforced to make it necessary. The reason why I was kind of thinking about that, I was thinking, OK, if they are all, even though they've got the virus, how many, I'll put it, they've got a thousand cases of the coronavirus in Sweden and six elderly people have died. They don't seem to be too bothered. So it made so then I started thinking about you know um, the RFID and whether it was you know it's all linked with the vaccines and because that they have it they've already got the vaccines or they they're not too partial you know there's not many people kind of protesting against it is that why they are carrying on their ordinary lives because it seems to be that the countries who want to force the RFID are creating a lot of um, hype about it. Well, there's a lot of things going on that trying to make a reason for it, whereas um, Sweden is more compliant. They don't have to make a case for it. 
it's a very efficient um, country and they just see it as a normal part. It's just a part of a normal day. They don't see it as anything unusual. They don't see it as sinister. They just go through it. So that was what I was wondering. Um, if that makes any sense, it probably doesn't. But it says the procedure costs $180. I wonder who pays that. I wonder if they're paying to have it done. I think if it's an efficient society and they see it as an as a advantage, maybe they're coughing it up. I don't know. And Denmark. Denmark has passed emergency law enabling forced corona, coronavirus vaccinations. That was on the 18th of March 2020. The government can force people to take the vaccine. And that emergency law is in place until March 2021. I think the UK is, is for two years, till 2022. Anyone who refuses the vaccine will face fines and potential prison time and will be prevented from travelling, entering shops, grocery stores, public institutions, hospitals and public transport if they don't have the vaccination. I mean, that's really drastic, isn't it? Just for vaccination. Why is it so compelling? I mean, why does it stop you from meeting your basic needs? It's really, really quite strange that you have to, mandatory have to, you have to have it. That's really strange. And if you don't have it, these are the consequences. Can't go to grocery stores, can't go into public institution. This is in Denmark. Can't go to hospitals, can't take public transport. Um, no travelling and no entering into shops. So I can see why they associate the vaccination with the mark of the beast. I can understand why they would do that. Because in this context, without the vaccination, you can't do anything or go anywhere. That's what this is saying in Denmark. Um, but there again, the vaccination would normally go in the arm. But so they, it can't be combined with the RFID chip because that would have to go in the hand. Not unless that's the second stage of the mandatory whatever. They've already given you a mandatory vaccine. And then probably maybe later. They're doing mandatory FRID, whatever you call it. So, um, what else? In Denmark, they had in the draft of their law, it would have allowed the police to enter private homes without a warrant to see if there was suspicion of coronavirus infection. Can you imagine? This is really, really quite bizarre. I mean, so preoccupied. Why is the government and the police so preoccupied? with who's got the coronavirus to the point where they would actually have police beating down their doors to find out. But that was dropped. It was it was appealed against. There was op opposition against it. And so it hasn't been made into law. But it just seems a bit extreme just for a virus which killed more people when they were doing when they had the flu. Than this, and it just seems so extreme measures, you know, just for the vaccination. I mean, I understand that they paid millions and millions for the vaccination. Is it just because they don't want to waste their money? So, is there a place you can go which is not compulsory? Somebody says maybe Russia, but. I don't think there's any escape from it, peeps. I don't think there's any escape. If you win millions and millions, maybe one of these remote areas that I spoke about, you haven't got it at all. Maybe they won't have mandatory um, testing. But it looks like, I don't know how many countries it's going to be mandatory in. So the UK government decided to extend visas for one year. This is a different subject. For the NHS workers from the EU and other countries of the permit where if their permits expire in the autumn so we've got a lot of um, migrant nurses and doctors and um, some of them they did get caught up in the system when 
the Home Office close their door to the public and they were unable to do their biometrics, but they've been now given automatic extension, all the doctors, all the NHS nurses. So, um, and that's if their visas are due to expire before the 1st of October 2020. But like I said, still apply just in case, you know, or ask or at least look at your documentation, make sure that what the protocol is for renewal. Um, so they've been automatically extended for a year and there's a lot of care workers that are saying, how come the NHS staff um, are being given an automatic extension and that they don't have to pay for because they're looking after the vulnerable and yet care staff who are doing the same thing are not getting that extension. They have to pay. One um, young lady, she was saying she's got to pay 2100 when her visa expires in September. And she doesn't understand why she doesn't get the free. But I think it's because health practitioners are qualified people, I assume. I assume they've, they've got some kind of, if they're doctors and nurses, they've gone through four or five years of training and getting qualifications. Whereas to be a care worker, um, you don't need similar qualification. Yes, you need your MVQ, but not to such a degree, not to such a high level. That's the only thing I can think of why they are extending the, um, the visas for doctors and nurses. Can't think of any other reason why they didn't, because if it was just a care profession and it was just about caring after caring for people, I think they would have given a blanket extension to everyone. Um, what else is there? Hmm. The NHS are really getting support all over the place because 1,000 landlords are offering homes to the NHS workers for free following reports that they said they have been facing eviction. Landlords deem them to be an infection risk, so they're evicting them. So a lot of landlords who know that their um, tenants work for the NHS feel that they mingle with um, the vulnerable or people who've got the virus. So they're evicting them from their houses or their, from their rooms or their flats. And an organisation or a company called NHS Homes, it puts health staff in touch with landlords willing to offer homes for free or next to nothing. So if you're an NHS staff member watching this video and you face an eviction, you need to contact NHS Homes. And like I said, they're offering homes for free or next to nothing, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, there's 400 rooms listed on NHS Homes and, um, com and it's worth a combined income of 1.2 million a month. That's how much landlords will be losing by offering free accommodation. So that's really impressive. Excel Hospital London, um, the new hospital, Emergency Nightingale Hospital. It's got 4,000 beds. It's now open. Um, and yeah, 2,000 beds and two morgues. So that's now open for business. Um, um, emergency NEC Hospital in Birmingham. That's catering for 5,000 beds. Manchester is catering for 1,000 beds. And that's at the Central Convention Centre. So the, we are expecting a lot of deaths in the UK. I think probably about as much as, well, that's catering for about 10,000 deaths, isn't it? If it's 4,000 in London, 5,000 in um, Birmingham and 1,000 in Manchester, that's kind of catering for 10,000 deaths. That's a hell of a lot. So that is my roundup for today. And I hope you found it useful. And that's all until tomorrow.